Welcome to a half hour of Mind Webs. Short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. book Transformations, Understanding World History Through Science Fiction, a collection edited by Daniel Roussel. We do I Kill Myself, a story by Julian Kowalik. Today I shall destroy the Zeta bomb. I shall do it this evening when I begin my tour of duty in the Army Laboratory. Today I have achieved the capacity for sacrifice. I realized that when I looked at the slender, mournful boughs of the trees. I can't say why it was just at the moment when I noticed the trees. I'm walking along an avenue in the park. I feel a keen rawness in the air. People go past me. They pay no attention to me. They don't know that I, a homely-looking man in a gray raincoat with big ears and a mole on the cheek, that I am capable of great self-sacrifice that this evening I shall turn the key in the door of an iron safe, open it, and take out something which looks like a large goose egg. That's the Zeta bomb. The distance between the contact pin and the critical point of the bomb is three millimeters. That's the distance to which Professor Lombard set the contact pin when he solicitously laid the Zeta in its plush case. The Zeta rests like a child in swaddling clothes. Today, I shall destroy the steel child. For today I have achieved the capacity to make this great sacrifice of myself. I must do it. I must free humanity from the terrible nightmare and that powerful might. Why should a tiny steel pin have power of life and death over people? So long as it doesn't touch the critical point, the sun will go on shining. When it does touch, night will fall. All men will die. and The birds will drop like meteors. By the force of its explosion, the Zeta bomb exceeds the most powerful hydrogen bomb a billion times. If it were to explode, the result would not be death. For death is an equal partner with life. One can argue with it, one can quarrel and be reconciled with it. In comparison with the consequences of an explosion of Zeta, death is something anodyne. The term death doesn't apply to the effects of that one must create a new word for it. I'm walking along the park avenues waiting for the evening. When evening comes, I shall destroy Professor Lombard's iron child. I shall unscrew the contact pin. I shall throw the bomb into a marsh and the pin into a river some five kilometers distant from the marsh. The Zeta and the pin will never meet again. And if they don't meet, the world will continue to exist. I shall burn the documents giving the sketches and specifications of the bomb and tread the ashes into the ground. Professor Lombard will not live long enough to give birth to a second iron child. I shall destroy the Zeta bomb. I shall do it for the sake of the trees, the animals, the birds, the people, the insects. I shall do it for my own sake and for the sake of that young man with black hair who is sitting on a bench hidden among the trees waiting for a girl. For you, gnarled elm, and for your inhabitant, the woodpecker, and for you, black worm corkscrewing through the earth. In the midst of all these peoples and trees, I feel an enormous and oppressive loneliness. I cannot tell anyone what I'm planning to do. I'm afraid they might stop me from destroying the bomb. But after all, great sacrifice demands great loneliness. If I talk about it, I'm sharing it with others, reducing its greatness. But the feeling of loneliness doesn't weaken my determination. The sky withdraws from the far end of the avenue, a sign that evening will soon be coming on. I leave the park. Today I shall walk to the laboratory. I take a road which shows up white among the small houses and crisscrossed fallow land. On my left, 
someone is singing. On my right, a gentle breeze is noisily tousling withered branches. After a moment, the singing and the sound of the wind both stop. All is still. Beyond a small pine wood, I come to the first control barrier. They shine a beam of light toward me. They've recognized me. The guards know the senior laboratory assistant very well. He's a quiet sort and docile with large ears and a mole on the cheek. I pass the first control barrier. The road is as smooth as a tabletop. The army laboratory has good roads leading to it. In a clump of leafy trees, I come to the second control barrier. They pick me out with three beams of light. As they do so, a single bird wakes up in a tree and begins to twitter. They scrutinize me closely, though all of them know I'm the senior laboratory assistant and initiated into all the secrets. Beyond the second control barrier, the road passes underground. Now I'm walking along a lighted tunnel. The side walls of the tunnel have innumerable little windows through which guards poke their heads. One must walk steadily and calmly along the tunnel. The best thing is to whistle. In a small hall, brilliantly lit, I show my identity papers. Then I enter a narrow corridor. A tall guard opens an iron door for me. Now I'm in the anteroom of the laboratory. I'm alone. I set to work. I bend over the secret drawer which contains the keys. It is known only to Professor Lombard, the Commander-in-Chief, and myself. I pick up the key. In the third room of the laboratory, I disconnect the alarm signal fixed to the iron safe. I open a drawer and take the Zeta bomb out of its plush case. Zeta is cold and slippery. I could destroy it here, in the laboratory. I could thaw it out, but that would take time, and the three junior laboratory assistants will be arriving in a few minutes. I conceal the bomb and the sketches in the broad pocket of my light raincoat, which I hang over my arm. I telephone to Professor Lombard using a one-figure number known only to me and the Commander-in-Chief. I tell him I have forgotten to bring important reagents from the store, and I must go for them myself at once. In a minute or two, I'm on my way. I am not detained at the control points. The Commander of the Guard has been informed that it is a question of getting important reagents swiftly. I have passed the last control barrier. Now there are no more lights. I turn off the main road. I'm going to cross flat, soft ground in the direction of an alder grove. Surely this must be a sown field. It is night, cold. I put on my raincoat. I have it. I have the bomb. With every step I take, I feel it knocking against my ribs. Now and again, I put my hand into the raincoat pocket to make sure it's there. It is. It is. I touch it with my hand. It is cold, slippery. Professor Lombard polished it, smoothed it. He gave it the gleam of a monstrous, distorting mirror. Under my forefinger, I feel the tiny head of the contact pin. All I have to do is slip back the safety catch, press that little head and then only invisible, inchoate fragments will be left of everything. However, the words visible and invisible wouldn't have any meaning, whatever, then. But, but that will never happen. Quite soon now, I shall throw the Zeta bomb into the marsh. I shall throw it with all my strength so that it flies into the very middle, where the mud is thinnest, where it will sink most easily and swiftly. I shall throw the contact pin into the river. Who will ever find a pin only a little thicker than a needle? And then? Then I must go into hiding. I must find a good hiding place, for they are sure to search for me. I dare say the whole of the police force, the special military departments and forces, all the secret service will, will all be called in to search for me. I can already see, already hear the orders being issued. The instructions intercrossing, how they'll be shouting, how they'll be whispering, all to find out where I am. But the great sacrifice to which I have dedicated myself cares nothing for such things. The great sacrifice must even require such things. And yet, 
the great sacrifice doesn't require that after I've destroyed the bomb, I should voluntarily and even frivolously put myself in the hands of those who have produced it. No, no, I cannot give them that pleasure. I cannot do anything which would give those wicked people the least satisfaction. And so, after I've destroyed Professor Lombard's Iron Child, I must conceal myself thoroughly. The people for whom I am making this great sacrifice will not defend me. It will be a long time before they even learn of my exploit, before they have any realization of its benefits. They will stop to consider the matter they will discuss, doubt, suspect. They will pluck up courage and succumb to cowardice, and maybe they will be ready to come to my defense only when it's too late. So I must seek out a good hiding place. But if they come upon my tracks, if I hear their steps, the clatter of belts hung about with weapons, the rustle of uniforms, the snorting of highly sensitive, perfectly trained dogs, shall I leave my hiding place with my hands up? Does my self-sacrifice call for putting up a valiant resistance or for valiant renunciation of resistance? For resistance. For valiant resistance. But my sacrifice connotes prudent resistance, which in certain circumstances demands that I should hide from the enemy, should deceive the enemy. So I shall not go out to meet the police with my hands up. Rather, the moment they see me, I shall spring at the throat of the nearest policeman. If I had a revolver, I could kill several before I died. If I had a machine gun, I could mow down several dozen from my hiding place. The ground over which I'm now walking is no longer even and soft. It's hard and crowded with little tussocks so it must be quite close to the alder grove. I think I see a dark patch in front. Yes, that surely is the alder grove. The marsh lies just beyond it. I'm coming across more and more of those little tussocks. My steps are inevitably becoming broken and short. At times my feet slip farther down than I expect. Then my body is subjected to an involuntary jolt. Then Zeta strikes more violently against my ribs. It reminds me more insistently of its presence. I swiftly thrust my hand into my raincoat pocket. It's there. It's there. It's not so cold now as it was. It's rather warmer. Its shape also isn't so ugly. But it's a monster threatening something which cannot be called death or silence or by any word from a modern dictionary. It's a tiny, sleeping monster. The dark patch grows blacker. Now the older grove is very close. All around is still. Now I can hear the gentle murmur of the trees. I am in the older grove. I'm walking along a narrow path. The trees surround me with a friendly air. They're whispering something to me. The Zeta bomb must be destroyed so that the alders can live. Beyond the alder grove, the ground grows soft again. But it's not the softness of a sown field. It's the springy softness of India rubber. I'm conscious of the marsh. I can hear it. It, too, has its voice. The voice of the marsh is like... It's like the heavy breathing of a dying man. I can still go on for the time being. My feet are not sinking in yet. I know I shall go on safely as far as the first clump of tall spear grass. So now only minutes are left. The ground is getting softer and softer. Now I am at the spot by a clump of spear grass. I hurriedly thrust my hand into my raincoat pocket. The bomb is warm. I hold its warm, smooth metal a long time in my palm. Then I cautiously take Zeta out of my pocket. Now it is lying on my palm. And so, in a moment, that will be happening. In a moment, the world will be freed from multitudinous death. But the world knows nothing about it. The world is quiet, indifferent, and sluggish. Is it possible that such a great deed can be accomplished in such great silence? I put the thumb and forefinger of my right hand on the safety catch. But just as I do so, I hear a loud rustling. I seize the safety catch between my fingers and release it. I'm being pursued. No. It's only the wind running over the reeds. 
But if it were indeed a pursuit, if dogs picking up my trail began to bark at the edge of the marsh, if the first policeman were to put in an appearance, after all, I could threaten them with a bomb. I could shout to them. I could say, Halt, I've got the Zeta bomb in my hand. With the safety catch released, the contact pin is one millimeter away from the critical point. If you advance a single step, I shall press the pin. And don't try shooting at me, for if I fall, the bomb will be given a violent jolt and it will explode. You'll perish. But I, I wouldn't be the only one to perish. And not only would they perish, millions of innocent people would perish. Such reasoning is not worthy of a man who has decided to sacrifice himself. And yet, the police will not move one step if I threaten them with the bomb. They're cowards. So nothing will happen to the world. My courage, which should accompany my sacrifice, will not suffer either, for I shall threaten the police. Not because they're afraid, but because they're in the service of those who produce the bomb, those I hate. So that threat and that hatred should be included in the program of sacrifice. I cling to this thought. I consider it fine and pure, for I can hold the makers of the Zeta bomb and their assistance under threat. I can do as I like with them. That's a wise sacrifice. I can command them to march to a hollow between hills and leave them there and starve them. I can send Professor Lombard there and even the chief of staff himself. I'm grateful to that rustle in the reeds. It has brought about a judicious change in my thinking. I shan't destroy the Zeta bomb today. Pity I didn't bring the plush box also when I brought it away. I'd have had something in which to keep it. I shall keep Zeta and devote it to the service of the good. I'm astonished that I could ever have forgotten the great significance of the bomb in this kind of service. Blind self-sacrifice made me regard it as only the source of a great evil. Prudence, which I now associated with a desire for sacrifice makes it possible for me to consider Zeta from various aspects. With Zeta's aid, I can see the world free from Zeta. By using it as a threat, I can order the laboratories in which it was to have serial production to be destroyed. I can render Professor Lombard harmless and all the experts on the bomb and its guards. I can do this if I screw the contact pin to a distance of one millimeter from the critical point. The threat of its explosion will compel them to submit and be absolutely obedient to me. With Zeta in my possession, I can destroy every wicked man. With Zeta, I can do much. I can do almost everything. Why do I say almost? Well, I'm in a position not only to achieve general reforms, but to break into the life of every man on this earth and arbitrarily change it. If I wish, the wealthiest of merchants will hand over his store to me. If I wish, Mrs. Amelia will forsake the husband she loves, will bow to me and go wandering about the world. If I wish, the daughter of the chief of staff will present herself naked to me. If I give the order, the nester of science will shave off his beard and climb a tree in the city park in broad daylight. I imagine the scene and laugh, the nester of science climbing to the top of the tree with the agility of a monkey. I already see people coming from all over the world and bowing to me and handing me all sorts of articles and titles. One gives me a sumptuous villa at the seaside. Another proposes that I should accept a doctorate of all the sciences. The third humbly explains that kingship is the finest form of government and that I am highly suited to be king, for I have a fine bearing and profound intelligence. Someone tells me I have very handsome ears. I try to cast out these thoughts, for I am to serve the good. I must set about the destruction of evil. That's why I'm keeping Zeta. In order to destroy evil, I must divide the people into wicked and good. I can do that. I shall be the supreme judge. But why the future tense? I am the supreme judge. There is no one higher than I. I touch Zeta, I stroke it. How beautiful it has become, how smooth and pleasant it is, how brilliantly it shines. I press Zeta to my heart, I kiss it. What am I saying, what am I doing? But why ask? 
I'm doing and performing that which ought to be done. All this is included within my enlarged program of human sacrifice. I cannot hesitate. I should be ridiculous if I hesitated. I am Caesar, Napoleon, Alexander the Great. I am the supreme judge. I am God. I surpass God. And I shout, I am God. The trees already know. They bow down to the ground. The human beings don't know it yet. I hurry back to the city by the shortest route. To judgment. I shall judge. All human beings are wicked. They must all be destroyed. I alone am good. I alone am good, for I possess Zeta. The title of that story was I Kill Myself, written by Julian Kowalik, translated from the Polish by Harry Stevens. It's a story that appears in a collection edited by Daniel Roselle called Transformations, Understanding World History Through Science Fiction. This is Michael Hansen speaking. Technical production for Mindwebs by Steve Gordon and Leslie Hilsenhoff. Mindwebs comes to you from WHA Radio in Madison, a service of University of Wisconsin Extension. Thank mm-hmm. you.